I want to focus on the theme of rejoicing and resting. And if you'll go to John chapter 12, we'll, we'll hop around just a little bit this morning, but um, yesterday we talked about the fact that we are not an accident, that God has designed us. He has designed us intricately. He has designed us with a purpose. He has designed us with limitations. Each of us have our own limitations. That's a reflection of God's design because we are not divine. Some, some people in this world want to imagine or want to believe they are divine, that they are their own gods, but we aren't. We reflect or we are created in the image of God. As such, we have intrinsic value. We are not worthless. On the other hand, we can't go to the other extreme and get puffed up and think, oh, well, look at me, I'm great. Because everything that we are and everything we do, everything that defines us, everything that we will be, is because of a gift of God. It's a reflection in some way of His image. Our purpose in life is not to mess it up. I want to move from there to rejoicing and re resting. And as I was reading the, uh, this, uh, these two stanzas in this song, I thought of John chapter 12, verse 12. And it's a record of the triumphal entry. On the next day, the great multitude who had come to the feast, when they heard that Jesus was coming to Jerusalem, took the branches of the palm trees and went out to meet him and began to cry out, Hosanna! So there was great rejoicing. There was great rejoicing in Christ coming into Jerusalem to really ultimately, in, in a very short time period now, to fulfill his purpose on earth. And that was to die for our sins so that our relationship, if we accept Christ's gift of free salvation, our relationship can be restored to the very one who created us. The fantastic thing about that as I meditate on that is that I am created in God's image. Sin has distorted that, and yet God still has desired to have that relationship to redeem us from this fallen body, this sinful nation. There's a lot to rejoice about that. Now, as I thought of that, uh, and I was meditating, I, I came across some information, and maybe some of you know this, but it was new to me. Um, I learned something new this year. <clears throat> Uh, you know, the palm branches that they waved and they, you know, they put their cloaks and they, you know, you see pictures of palm branches on the ground. And, and I kind of grew up with the idea that, well, um, you know, ladies, years ago, guys, we don't do this anymore because nobody wants to get their jacket dirty. But it used to be, you know, years ago, it was chivalrous, right? If a lady was going to walk across the streets, and they were typically muddy, okay, that a guy might take off his coat put it on the ground so that you wouldn't get your tootsies dirty, right? Okay, and remember this was also days when dresses were long, so you know that was a very nice thing. So I kind of grew up with this idea that the spreading of palm branches on the ground was in some way honoring Christ and kind of paving, kind of like a red carpet treatment only it was palm branches. That's what I used to think. I learned something this year. Um, that's not what the palm branches were at all. In fact, in ancient Israel at that time, palm branches were a sign of kind of nationalistic identity. So if you were Israeli or if you were Jewish and you were proud of it, one way you could show your patriotism was to wave palm branches. And because it wasn't an overt act of rebellion, the Romans really didn't do anything about it. So when, when I realized that, I realized, you know, this is interesting. It puts Christ 
entry into Jerusalem in a little different light because we know, and this reinforces it, that a lot of Jewish people said, oh good, he's the Messiah, he's going to come and he's going to get rid of the Romans who they considered their oppressors. He's going to be our earthly king and he's going to set up a kingdom like King David. He's going to run the Romans out of town. And so they weren't looking for a restored relationship. What they were looking for was a restored um, kingdom in, in, in an earthly sense, a political kingdom. They missed the boat completely. So when you think of that, it's kind of like waving those palm branches and putting them on the ground. It's kind of like well, tomorrow's the 4th of July. What's typically waved on the 4th of July? Flags. Flags. I mean, that's a show of our patriotism. So if you can kind of see it in that same, that same idea, um, that's what they were saying. That's what a lot of people were thinking about this Jesus, who they really didn't know. They just heard a lot of things about him. They heard he healed people. He fed people. I mean, that's the kind of king I would want. Somebody that if I got sick would take care of me, and somebody if I was hungry would take care of me. I wouldn't have to do anything. I mean, you know, that would be easy street. So I thought, you know, what if that had been Jesus' true mission? Got me thinking along those lines, and then, you know, I get a little crazy sometimes, and all of you know that I'm a world-published poet, right? From la those of you that were last year. <laughs> so I decided I would write the beginning of a Christian rap song that Jesus might have sung as he came into Jerusalem. Okay, and I titled it the triumphal rap song. Okay, and, and if Jesus had, su had sung this, I think it would have fit right in with what a lot of people thought about Jesus. And it begins like this. Yo losers, I'm light to liberate you from the legions. Okay, that's as far as I got. Sorry. Okay. Okay. Yeah, some of you are rejoicing right now, aren't you, Mr. Haynes? You can fill in the rest if you want. But that wasn't really why God came. That really wasn't God, why God came. Go over to Luke 19, verse 37 and 40. 37 through 40. And as he was appro now approaching near the descent of the Mount of Olives, sorry, I went too fast. It's on page 126 in my Bible, if that helps, okay? As he was now approaching near the descent of the Mount of Olives, the whole multitude of the disciples began to praise God joyfully. There's the rejoicing, because they understood to a certain extent why Jesus was here. They began praising God joyfully with a loud voice for all the miracles which they had seen. Notice that? Praising God joyfully with a loud voice for all the miracles which they had seen, saying, Blessed is the King who comes in the name of the Lord. Peace in heaven and glory in the highest. There's a real commotion. What was generating a commotion, though, even in the disciples? Yeah, it was all based on things that they had seen, tangible things. And he answered and said, I tell you, if these become silent, the stones will cry out. Jesus understood it was his entry into Jerusalem was the beginning of a period of time where God's plan of redemption from eternity was going to be fulfilled. It was a cause for great rejoicing. But on the other side, the, cl the crowd and even some of the di disciples defaulted to what's in it for me. Young people, I think that's what we do in our relationship with God. God wants a relationship with us, but what do we default to? We default to, and I do the same thing, what's the stuff I want from God? The stuff... Any of you want stuff from God? Think about your prayers. When you talk to God, just think big picture. When you talk to God, do you talk to Him more about relation, your relationship with Him? Or do you talk to Him more about the stuff you want? God, please heal. God, can you help me with this test? Okay, it's stuff. And I, I think if we're really honest, we spend a lot of our time asking God for stuff. So we're really no different. We lose sight of the fact that what we can really rejoice in is that not only we're made in God's image, 
but he desires a relationship with us. Do you understand what that means? The God of all eternity wants a relationship with me? Why me? I don't know, other than I know he loves me. That's cause for great, great rejoicing in my life. I clip it short though when I focus on stuff and I just see God as a giant gumball machine. I put in my want prayers, I turn the handle or push the button, whatever they do on gumball machines these days. Gee, maybe they don't even have gumball machines. I'm dating myself, but and out comes the gumball. Any of you, when you were little in the grocery store, just nag your mother relentlessly, can I please, can I have a quarter to put in the gumball machine? Yeah, really irritated your parents, didn't it? I mean, when you think about it. Do you think it saddens God that we miss the joyfulness of his relationship that he desires because we want to treat him like a gumball machine? Let me ask it a different way. Do you all have some sort of a relationship with your parents? Do you? I hope so. I hope, I mean, I hope when you get up in the morning you don't go to a breakfast table and say, who are you? <laughs> okay, I hope they don't ever do that to you. Okay, let me ask you something. Which would you rather have from your parents? Things or stuff or their undivided attention? Now, yeah, they may not understand everything you go through and, you know, they may be kind of ancient, um, but which is more important to you? Stuff from your parents or being able to have a, a, conversa a conversation with them where you can share some of the things that are bothering you, some of the, your feelings, some of the things you're struggling with and where they can say, I, I understand. It's been like centuries since I was your age, but I went through a variation of that and I can understand and have them put their arms around you and just give you a hug. Not being, you know, condemning or anything else. Which would you rather have? This is the interactive part of chapel. Would you rather have that kind of relationship? Would you rather just get stuff from your parents? Which would you rather have? Relationship. Yeah. I know in Mrs. Pinkham's relationship uh, with me, uh, I can do all kinds of things for her and it it's a way I say that I love her and she gets excited about it. But there are times as a man I have to say, Dan, shut up. Mrs. Pinkham just needs a hug. She needs to know that she's loved in a different way other than the physical things I do for her. Do you think our relationship with God should be any different? It shouldn't. It shouldn't. I want to go to another passage. Isaiah 55. Because one of the things that we struggle with, I struggle with, I think every, every person with a restored relationship with Jesus struggles with the fact that, okay, I can rejoice in who I am before the Lord. I can rejoice in that relationship. But there's a tendency to want to take back control. And I want to tell you that in Isaiah we see a fantastic passage that talks about the fact that we can count on God's word. He never breaks his word. In fact, I was thinking about it last night because I've done this. Sorry, Barb, Dr. Hall. I've done this more than once. It's embarrassing. But you, have you ever been playing in an ensemble and you get to the end of the piece and the conductor cuts it off and you realize you're one beat behind and you're the only one out there hanging on that note and you're like, wow, I'm just twisting in the wind and I look like an idiot. Do you know that God will never leave you like that? If you get behind him, he'll pull you along unless your heart is in rebellion to him. He'll never leave you hanging like that last note that conductors just absolutely hate, right? It just, I, I've seen it, I've never experienced it because, praise the Lord, I've never been asked to conduct anything. And I, but I imagine <laughs> even for choir directors, doesn't it just make you shrivel up and cringe when you hear that, Mr. Harding? It's like, oh, 
Oh, and you can't let on to the audience because that just makes it worse, okay? You can't throw the baton at them. But everybody knows you're just hanging out there all by yourself because you were off. God's not like that. He, he sees it coming. You know, conductors are somewhat helpless. When you're a note off, they can look at you. And they, they can try and give you, and they can do all kinds of hand motions. But they can't force you to get on the beat unless you do it yourself. God's not like that. He works with us. And he brings us along. And he gets us in sync with what he desires, with his word. God's word always accomplishes his purpose. Isaiah 55. So, shall my word be which goes forth from my mouth. It shall not return to me empty without accomplishing what I desire. That's a promise. We can rejoice in that promise, but we can rest in that promise. That's what that, those verses say that we, just re, that we just sang at the beginning. It shall not return to me empty without accomplishing what I desire and without succeeding in the matter for which I sent it. God is always successful. We can rest in that. We can count on that. What trips us up is sometimes when we look for things as a result and God has something else in mind, something he wants to teach us in our lives that isn't wrapped up in a thing, something about who we are, something about our relationship to him. Verse 12, you know if you rejoice and you rest in that relationship with God, something happens. For you go out with joy, and you'll be led with peace. The mountains and the hills will break forth into shouts of joy before you, and all the trees of the field will what? Clap their hands. There's a, there's a figure of speech there. There's a picture. There's a picture there. Instead of the thorn bush, the cypress will come up. Instead of the nettle, the myrtle will come up, and it will be a memorial to the Lord for an everlasting sign which will not be cut off. Your relationship with your heavenly father and the impact of his word on your life in your relationship with him is a testimony for all. It's, a, it's the end product of what God's trying to accomplish in your life. Now, Gretchen, come up to the piano. Mr. Haynes, we have to sing this. I neglect it. Miss Hayes, did they go last Saturday? No. It'll be the 14th? Yes. Okay. So those of you who are going to be here on Saturday the 14th, those of you who aren't, you need to sign up for another week, right? Amen. Okay. We're going to Letchworth State Park. And I was thinking of this too. Every time I go to, the, to that park and I, we go down through those, those canyons, so to speak, and we see everything around us, I'm just amazed at again at the freshness and the beauty and the diversity of what God's hand has created. It reminds me that I have a relationship with an infinite God that I can't comprehend with a finite mind and it is so exciting to me. It just fills me with joy and on the other hand I find the time not only a joyful time but a very restful time. Uh, it's away from the schedule but I, as I'm looking at it, it's like I serve a great God. I serve a great God. Some of you that will be here on the 14th will get to see that, but it doesn't just have to be Letchworth. It can be as we walk around this campus and we see the beautiful greenery and some of the things that are on this campus. Look at the, that second and third stanza to This Is My Father's World. Dr. Shu understood 
This was his father's world. His ears listened. All around him, and I don't know how many times, whether it was Muncie or even Philadelphia, which was like right next to the city, which I have a hard time really appreciating God's nature in the city. Sorry, I've been too much out in the country. Okay, But even in Philadelphia and, and here, definitely, over and over again, I would hear Dr. Shu remark about something beautiful he saw. And, and it brought him great joy in his relationship with God. And he felt so at ease and at peace, he could rest. This is my father's world. I rest me in the thought of rocks and trees, of skies and seas, his hand the wonders wrought. Dr. Shu, I do, the faculty and staff do. My prayer is that, that you have a restored relationship with our Heavenly Father because of what Christ has done. When he came into that city and then ultimately died for our sins, a restored relationship with your Creator is a rejoicing relationship. And it should be a restful relationship. I don't know if you're having a hard time being joyful in the Lord today. I don't know if you're agitated or upset about something today. But stop and think about your relationship with your Heavenly Father. Are you asking Him for things? Or are you asking Him to have that true one-to-one -one relationship? And as Dr. Shu knew and demonstrated to us year after year at camp, and those of us when we were with him outside of camp, when that relationship is right, when the focus is on our Heavenly Father and not on the things we want, then it just is so natural to rejoice. It is so natural to enjoy even the hard times in our lives the difficult stretches in our lives. We can still have an inner joy even though we may know we're going to have to push ourselves for that piece of music or that solo or whatever it is or that relationship that's fractured between our parents or our siblings or maybe some really close friend. We can still have the joy of the Lord even in those difficult times. And even when things upset us, we can still rest in the confidence of that relationship with the God who created us. That's my prayer for each one of you young people this morning, is that in that relationship you focus on the person of that relationship, our Heavenly Father, through Jesus Christ, and that you live a life of rejoicing and rest. If you're struggling with that, bring it before the Lord today and say, Lord, I need to adjust the focus of our relationship. I, I'm off in this. I want things, and I know I'm missing the greater joy of what you have for us. If you're struggling with that and you're kind of hitting a brick wall and you just don't know how to get past it, talk to Mrs. Pinkham. Talk to me. Talk to your counselors. Talk to your, to your teacher as they have time. Share with them what it is you're trying to work through. They may not be able to help you solve it, but they can sit and they can put their arms around you as a physical presence of our Father's love and at least pray for you. Let's pray. Father, we thank you that you love us and you are concerned about every little detail in our lives. But more important, I thank you that you love us so much. You are concerned more about who we are than what we do. That you are concerned more that we have a close, intimate relationship with you than the things that we think are important. Father, I thank you for that blessing, and I rejoice in it, and Father, I rest in it. I may not always feel restful, but I rest in it, and I thank you for that blessing. Truly, you are a great God, and we love you, I love you, and we serve you. In Jesus' name, amen.